good afternoon and hello everyone uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar uh, which is the ciac webinar series uh, ciac india webinar on the topic non responsive respondent how to take the arbitration forward uh, the topic is uh, obviously very interesting because uh, there are several reasons uh, why a respondent would uh, uh, not uh, cooperate or respond to an arbitration proceedings uh, and uh, it becomes even more critical uh, as to how those arbitration proceedings are conducted uh, because at the end of the day uh, you want to continue the proceedings but you want an award uh, which is uh, not getting affected by such non response uh, as everyone knows there are very limited grounds to challenge the award and one such ground is uh, if one of the parties have not got the due process or due opportunity to respond or put forward their uh, submission so i think it uh, it becomes even more important to ensure uh, that uh, the correct procedures are followed uh, in that scenario so with that background and the importance of the topic let me uh, straight away introduce a very very uh, interesting uh, panel uh, that we have we have views both from singapore and india uh, and uh, they are very accomplished practitioners uh, who have seen this situations many times in their uh, practice so it would be great to have their views uh, so first we have kavrav pachnanda who is a senior advocate and door tenant with fountain court chambers london and singapore uh, we also have prakash pillai a partner and head of international commercial arbitration clyde and clo classes singapore uh, we have nirav shah partner at dsk legal uh, and sarjit singhil senior partner at shuklin and bok llp singapore so we have uh, pretty much all the aspects uh, uh, being covered uh through this uh, panel and uh, i would straight away go into the topic uh so far as uh, uh this webinar is concerned so a non responsive respondent uh and one always wonders uh why would someone not take the opportunity to put forward its case it sounds uh, sometimes bizarre uh sometimes you are not able to get through uh the reasons or the logic of such a decision or an advice sometimes given to a respondent uh that it is not required you to uh you know uh go through the process we will challenge the award as and when it is passed uh and it can be for varied reasons so let me first get nirav in because uh, compared to singapore i guess india would have such situations uh much more uh for uh, obviously various reasons but let's hear from nirav as to what is his experience uh as to which are the typical reasons for a respondent to not respond to arbitration proceeding uh is it valid it is uh, not valid do you think there are logical reasons to it uh if you can throw some practical experience on that sure thanks a lot vyapak there are many reasons why a respondent may choose not to participate in an arbitration or not respond to arbitral tribunal for example a party may not want to participate in the pendency of a dispute before a court or a tribunal in india which pretty much covers the disputes that are being raised before the tribunal or non existence of an arbitration agreement or exorbitant costs which a party may not be able to afford uh, i have had two peculiar experiences where clients contemplated whether to participate in arbitration the first was an international commercial arbitration where dispute had already arisen and union party had initiated proceedings for operation and mismanagement before the company law board as it was then known and foreign party had filed an application before the company law in the proceedings and refer the parties to arbitration this application was heard at length by the company law board and the same was dismissed by the company law board and refu uh, and it refused to refer the dispute to arbitration on the ground that the disputes before the company law board 
were far broader and some of the reliefs that were sought could not be granted by the arbitral tribunal. During this time, the foreign party had also initiated an overseas arbitration and pushed for appointment of an emergency arbitrator for certain urgent reliefs. During this hearing, the Indian party opposed the initiation of arbitration on the grounds that all issues raised by the foreign party before the arbitral tribunal were already pending adjudication and were subjudiced before the company law board where the foreign party was actively litigating. The Indian party argued that if both the company law board and the arbitral proceedings were to proceed independently and simultaneously, there was a risk of conflicting judgment being passed on by both the tribunals. However, the emergency arbitrator ruled against the arguments of the Indian party and held that the issues of jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal would be decided at the time of the final arguments. The Indian party was in a fix whether to participate in the arbitration proceedings or remain absent. After much deliberations and consultations, the Indian party decided to participate in the arbitration proceedings because there was a good chance that the arbitration proceedings would conclude much faster than the proceedings before the company law board. And if the Indian party decides not to participate and if it were to lose in the arbitration, it will be very difficult for that party to resist enforcement of that award. Another experience I had in domestic arbitration, which truly was bizarre, when I was advising my client not to participate in arbitration proceedings. There was a dispute under the contract between my client and the other side. The final contract which was executed by the parties and the other side did not have an arbitration clause. However, the tender document which was floated by the other side in which my client had participated had an arbitration clause. The final contract did not have arbitration clause. It made no reference to the tender document and it made no reference to the arbitration agreement in the tender document. Disputes arose between the parties and my client was in the process of filing a substantive action before a court of law for compensation and damages. Peculiarly, the other side invoked arbitration under the contract, appointed one of his lawyer friend as an arbitrator. The bizarre part was the invocation of arbitration, the other side designated my client as the claimant and itself as the respondent. Surprisingly, the arbitrator acted immediately, convened a preliminary meeting between the parties. My client objected to the same on the ground that there was no arbitration agreement. And the question of me being a claimant does not arise because there was no arbitration agreement. Uh, and that fact that my client had not appointed him as the arbitrator. The arbitrator anyway proceeded with the preliminary hearing. And in the absence of my client, he passed preliminary directions for filing pleadings, completion of pre-trial formalities, and filing of evidence, etc. Upon receipt of the preliminary directions by email, our client once again wrote to the arbitrator asking him not to proceed with the arbitration as my client had not appointed him and there was no invocation of arbitration due to lack of arbitration agreement. My client also raised the issue with regard to the hasty manner in which the arbitrator was proceeding with the arbitration. In the meantime, we managed to file a recovery action, substantive action before the court of law and brought this conduct before the attention of the court. Promptly after we did this, the arbitrator relented and he stepped down as an arbitrator. So to sum it up, in my view, there can be multiple reasons why a party may choose not to participate in addition to the fact that the party may not be able to afford participating in an arbitration. Sure. Thanks a lot, Nirav. I think, uh, uh, thanks for sharing uh, such bizarre but very interesting uh, uh, incidences and uh, situations, which uh, I think uh, we in India do, uh, you know, uh, come across, I would not say often, but at least uh, quite a few times uh, during the process. But uh, Prakash, uh, you uh, both in Singapore and India, you have advised several clients. Uh, I'm sure some of your experiences with regard to Indian arbitration may may not <coughs> Uh, resonate to what Nero said, but uh, purely from a Singapore perspective, do you see such situations common? Uh, what are the typical situations? Why would a respondent not uh, respond? <coughs> and uh, how do you, you know, handle them in sense? Uh, we'll go into the process a little later, but just the reasons behind why would somebody do this? Uh, maybe your experience in Singapore. Uh, thank you very much, Vyapak. Well, you know, when you think of the non-responsive respondent, 
what springs to mind. I mean, you use the expression bizarre and strange, but I think what typically springs to mind is a delinquent type of respondent. You know, somebody who uh, is trying to, having signed up to an arbitration clause, an arbitration agreement, has then decided not to sort of take part in the very process that he signed up for. So it's a sort of, you know, a defaulter, somebody who's trying to escape the consequences of his default. So that some springs to mind, but is that always the case? Uh, I would say no, uh, you know, uh, they, I would divide them into two types of non-responsive respondents. The first being uh, culpable non-responsive respondents, the second non-culpable. For the culpable ones, uh, yes, you can get the delinquent guy who plays a, sort of a tactical game. He may think that, uh, you know, he's breached a contract. Uh, he doesn't have much of a defense. So let's, uh, you know, make a break for it. You know, we, there's no point going through all of this because I'm going to lose. But I still don't want to pay up because I'm still trying to maneuver and get out of uh, having to pay up the full sum. So I'm going to play some games with you and just not turn up and see what happens. And that ties in with uh, the, you know, uh, subspecies of that which is uh, uh, the sort of del uh, delinquent respondent who comes from, you know, a jurisdiction, his assets have a jurisdiction that uh, may not be as amenable to international arbitration enforcement as some places, uh, you know, like Singapore and, you know, other well-known centers. Uh, you know, I mean, in, in the past, I think India used to be one of them. I, some might, might stay, it's still one of them, but, uh, you know, I think India has changed. In the past, you used to get that type quite a bit because you, you use the Indian system, uh, uh, you know, of delay and, you know, and you dealt with a regime at the time of, you know, which was not very familiar with international arbitration. Things have changed a lot in India, you know, so you, you I think, see uh, a bit less of that, of somebody trying to use his home ground advantage to thwart enforcement, and as a result, doesn't respond to an arbitration. In our part of the world, world, I mean, the one I'm more familiar with is actually Indonesian uh, counterparties. Uh, because Indonesia, and I've had an experience with, with that, quite a painful one, you know, where we managed to get the award. But enforcing it in India uh, is very, very, in Indonesia is very, very difficult. It's, it's not that difficult to register uh, an award and convert it into a local judgment. But when it comes to execution, all kinds of blocks, delays, uh, you know, rehearings of matters are, are possible, you know, and it, it becomes a very difficult proposition. So that type of... Uh, a culpable, non-responsive respondent knows his own home ground system and knows that let me get out of all of this and you come after me in my jurisdiction where I'm going to block you. But then you have the non-culpable non type. Uh, there's the type that can't afford it, the impecunious uh, respondent. That type generally doesn't have any funds. He just can't pay lawyers. He doesn't, you know, he's possibly a bit clueless as well. And just takes shelter in like an ostrich, puts his head in the sand and, you know, just hopes it goes away, you know. Uh, they're not trying to do anything other than, you know, not incur more costs. I mean, essentially, they just can't afford to move. But, you know, insolvent companies can fall in that category. But I think more uh, 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 interesting is the, the other type of non-culpable respondent, the type that has genuine jurisdictional objections. There is this, that type of respondent doesn't think the arbitration agreement is valid. Maybe the, he says it doesn't exist. Maybe he says the dispute doesn't fall within uh, the scope uh, of the arbitration clause, and therefore you're outside it. And that kind of respondent is not delinquent. He's, he's basically saying, you know, there is no arbitration agreement for me to be a part of, you know, or it falls outside the scope of the arbitration agreement. So there should be no arbitration. This tribunal should not have any jurisdiction. Now, it, this played itself out uh, in a very interesting court of appeal case in Singapore uh, called Rakta Arak Shaka Lanka uh, against Avant Garde Maritime Services, where there was such a uh, uh, respondent being uh, Rakna, Rakta Arak Shaka Lanka, uh, which was a Sri Lankan government linked entity. And they, there was an arbitration against them. Uh, they didn't participate, they didn't file a notice, they just wrote correspondence. They sent a letter to SIAC to say, it, you know, it's a, it's a breach of public policy of Sri Lanka and it's beyond the scope of matters to be submitted for arbitration. So therefore, they didn't participate. They wrote another letter later on to say there was a settlement agreement. So therefore, uh, you know, we are not going to participate. We should withdraw and we are withdrawing. Now, uh, this, uh, what happened was the, the tribunal still, 
you know, claim jurisdiction uh, in a preliminary meeting, uh, bearing in mind the objections fr from Lanka. Uh, what, then it went on for arbitration, I think it took about a year, year and a half, went through, the claimant got the award. In the end, they still managed to set aside the award on the basis that you, you don't, if you have a genuine objection to jurisdiction, and it's a genuine objection, and you choose not to participate on that basis, you do not lose your right to challenge it. I mean, one of the points being that under Article 16.3 of the model law, there was a ruling by the tribunal that it had jurisdiction. So under the model law, which Singapore is uh, you know, a part of, you, what happens then is that you, are, you have 30 days to appeal, which Lanka didn't do. But still, the Court of Appeal, the High Court said it lost its right to set aside the jurisdiction on the basis that you basically, by not turning up, you, the, the, the claimant had wasted all this time and cost, and, you know, and, as, and you, you can't work with the system that way. The Court of Appeal said, no, you're under no duty to take part in an arbitration. And as long as you maintain that objection, that it's you know, genuinely, and you do not take part the, you know, you, uh, in the arbitration, you can set it aside after the award. This was a sting in the tail. And it's an interesting tactical dynamic or equation here, because you have on the one hand, the claimant you know, who takes the risk that if you have a non-responsive respondent who says there's no jurisdiction, you carry on, you may actually you know, get stung by the tail of the scorpion. But in the end, but, but the respondent also takes a risk because by not turning up, he obviously increases the chances of the claimant's success considerably. So it's, it's a wonderful dynamic, but it tells you that if you have a genuine jurisdictional objection, the law is on your side. The law doesn't insist that you show your hand and the fact of a tribunal not having jurisdiction ultimately prevails. It doesn't have jurisdiction and it can be set aside at a later time. So having heard uh, Nirov and Prakash on several genuine and non-genuine situations, I think uh, it's very common for, uh, at least in India, to go to senior advocate to get some more clarity. And that's what we would do now. Uh, we'll go to Gaurav. Uh, there can be situations, it's not uncommon to have a non-responsive respondent uh, and it can be genuine as well. But uh, it becomes even more important for the Tribunal and Claimants Council uh, to ensure the process followed is proper and the award ultimately, whichever way it goes, uh, it is insulated from any challenge on such ground of uh, you know respondent not being served or deliberately are avoiding notices uh, and therefore they get a chance to challenge on those grounds and not the grounds which Prakash was saying which was on merits on jurisdiction. So uh, Gaurav, what's your uh, thought on the role for both the tribunal and claimant uh, uh, for a arbitration like that uh, where you don't have a respondent to bring his or her view uh, on the issue? So, uh, you know, I'll start from the point that, um, that Prakash made earlier about the role of Indian courts. And when I express my view um, about this, this, this topic, I think what is important to note is that while the general trend of courts in India to interfere with arbitral awards, whether for the purpose of setting aside or for the purpose of uh, enforcement, the general trend of courts in India has moved in the other direction, in the sense that their most commercial courts are very reluctant to interfere. And, and to be very honest, there is a view that in fact, they, sh they interfere less than they, they are required to interfere or they ought to interfere. But the problem still remains that we have an additional problem of a clogged system. So even in the small percentage of cases that you manage to get past admission and get into the system, um, despite this change in trend, it is still possible for a party to prolong an enforcement or a setting aside proceeding and, and, and get the matter delayed for very long. So I think with keeping that in mind, one of the most, I mean, one can look at uh, two aspects. One, of course, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you sort of ensure compliance or service for the purpose of satisfying an Indian court that this was all, all, all okay. And then what more do you do in, 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 in addition to sort of obviate any further challenge? Um, 
generally Indian courts would, would respect, um, respect the, the, the institutional rules that prescribe a particular method of, uh, of service. Generally, Indian courts would, um, if in addition to those rules, you've complied with general requirements of Indian law, for example, Section 3 of the Arbitration Act requires that you serve either in person or at the last known address. Um, general clauses that would give you the benefit of presumption if you additionally serve by registered post. Generally, uh, Indian courts now are, are quite sensitive to all such requirements having been complied with. Um, often there would be a procedural order. Often the respondent has participated at the time that procedural order was made and the process of service has been agreed to. So the general trend, I think, will be that Indian courts can 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 uh, would 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 be sensitive to proper service, and and the, there are one or two recent judgments of the Supreme Court which which are very very emphatic uh, in the sense that the only situations that they would consider interfering in would be situations where um, uh, where the non-participation was because of matters outside the control of the party. So if, if the party really was prevented for, because of circumstances beyond its control, for example, there was no service at all. The party genuinely had, had no notice of the proceedings. Or for example, the party um, in a situation like COVID, something like that was not able to, not able to appear. Other than that, I think general, generally Indian courts are very reluctant to interfere in such matters now. Um, uh, a question came up recently, um, a few years ago, before the before the Delhi High Court, and, and uh, an attempt was made to get service of arbitral process done through court. That, of course, is still not possible. You know, court, I mean, there's nothing in the Indian law anywhere where you can use the process of of, of um, the court system to 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 serve the respondent in arbitral proceedings. There is a very interesting judgment of the Supreme Court in Delta Distilleries where. The, the power of, of an arbitral tribunal to request the court to summon a witness before it has been sort of given a very innovative and a wider interpretation. So maybe not for the purpose of uh, serving a respondent, but if going forward, even in an ex parte proceeding, the tribunal feels that it requires the oral evidence of the respondent, a person, and it could still make a representation to the court and and as you know, these, the, the, the relevant statutory provision in India now has powers of contempt given to tribunal to make a representation if such a direction is not followed. So there are, in that sense, I think you can't, while you can't use courts for the purpose of service, you can still, perhaps, arbitral tribunals might be able to use that process for the purpose of getting evidence before them. Um, uh, I think broadly, uh, broadly, I, I believe that, uh, as I said, the general trend is, is not to even unknowingly or inadvertently help the delinquent uh, participant. As a matter of fact, I think the general trend is that a party that has genuinely signed up to an arbitration agreement would find the courts not, not, um, not compassionate or not accommodating at all, even if they have uh, some other genuine difficulty of the nature like financial difficulties and things like that. So broadly, I think that is the trend that I see in Indian courts. I, I don't know what Sarjit's view is on this matter. Yeah, um, I was uh, actually coming to him. So Sarjit, uh, of course, India, uh, we have our own uh, challenges in terms of uh, service to the respondent, what is uh, valid, what is not valid. Somebody may avoid it deliberately because it's still not common to have electronic service or at least addresses available for a lot of respondents and so on and so forth. But uh, what's your take on it from a Singapore and a jurisdiction's perspective? Particularly, do the rules uh, of SIAC or other institutions which do conduct arbitration under uh, provide some guidance or uh, provide some notes as to how to proceed uh, or tribunal and the council is on their own to decide what is uh, you know, reasonable and what is there to make sure that the award is not susceptible to any enforcement uh, challenges. Um, thanks, Neeraf. Um As far as uh, uh, SIAC is concerned, right, uh, the onus is actually on the claimant to ensure that the respondent is given notice of the arbitration. So unlike the rules of court, you know, where there are specific uh, modes prescribed and the like, 
uh, in the SIAC rules, there are no such modes uh, prescribed for service of the notice of arbitration on the respondent. In fact, if one looks at Rule 3.4, it says the claimant shall, at the same time as it files the notice of arbitration with the registrar, send a copy of the notice of arbitration to the respondent and shall notify the registrar that it has done so specifying the mode of service employed and the date of service. So the onus is really on the claimant to ensure that the uh, respondent re receives the, no the notice of arbitration. So uh, how does one serve in an arbitration? The first part of call has to be the agreement itself. Uh, does the uh, agreement which contains the arbitration clause uh, actually have uh, a, a specific mode of service on the respondent? Uh, if the agreement provides that you know you can serve say on the respondent at a specific address or on his solicitors who are named in the agreement, then uh, one would abide by that agreement and serve accordingly. But often uh, there is no such agreement. Uh, then of course, uh, if it's a company, you will serve it at the registered address of the company. But here again, there could be a problem because the company may have uh, gone out of business and you know, uh, or it may just have disappeared from that address, um, even though that's the registered address. So what we normally do is we will actually uh, serve it at the registered address and then send a copy to the director's uh, personal addresses, which are found in the uh, registry of company ser uh, search. So uh, in, in that way, uh, we will be able to convince the court at the end of the day that that's how we brought the notice to the attention of the respondent. Now, another mode of service that has uh, become quite popular these days is service by email. And I think there is some authority, especially uh, uh, from the English courts. Uh, there is this case of Bernouth Lines Limited versus High Seas Shipping, where the English courts have actually accepted uh, uh, email service as a valid mode of service for arbitration proceedings. Uh, but here, a word of caution, make sure that you know when you uh, serve uh, by email, uh, you must require a confirmation of receipt. Because otherwise, like the English court said in that case, uh, you may not be able to pr uh, prove that uh, it was received by the respondent. So once the, um, once the respondent has been served and the tribunal and the claimant is satisfied that notice of the arbitration has been given to the respondent, then comes the issue if the respondent is non-responsive and doesn't turn up at all. So what, what does the tribunal do? Does the tribunal ensure that at each stage of the proceedings, uh, the respondent is kept informed? Or if he doesn't turn up, does the tribunal just shut the respondent out? Frankly, no tribunal wants to shut a respondent out. So most tribunals, if not all tribunals, will direct the claimant to keep the respondent informed of the uh, proceedings at each stage of the proceedings. And um, I'm... I believe that you know, if you look at say the SIAC rules or the ICC rules or the LCI rules, there's really nothing there that uh, um, uh, obliges the tribunal or you know gives any hint that the tribunal should actually keep the respondent, a non-responsive respondent, uh, uh, updated on the proceedings. But there is guidance to be drawn from uh, the. some rules known as the Chartered Institute of Arbitrator Rules. And this Chartered in uh, Institute of Arbitrator Rules uh, actually provide that uh, when faced with a non-participating party, that's a non-responsive re respondent, before proceeding with the arbitration, arbitrators should satisfy themselves to the extent that they are able to do so on the limited information available that the claimant has a prima facie case and that all parties were properly notified of the proceedings. Arbitrators should also satisfy themselves that the non-participating party has no 
acceptable excuse for its non-participation. I think that's very important because as uh, the, the previous speakers have highlighted, if there is an excuse for not participating, like taking the view that, you know, uh, the dispute falls outside the arbitration agreement, uh, then really uh, the non-responsive respondent can just sit at the sidelines and allow the claimant and the tribunal to carry on. Uh, and then uh, Article 4 of those same rules says, arbitrators should inform and as necessary ask the participating party to notify the non-participating party of what is occurring in the proceedings and should record in writing all procedural steps and efforts to include that party in the proceedings. And I think Article 5 is also very interesting. It says, before making any award, arbitrators should give a notice of their intention to make such award to all the parties, that means including the non-responsive uh, respondent, in the event that they proceed to make a final award, the tribunal should make sure that any efforts to include the non-participating party in the proceedings are recited in that award. So I think this is more from the tribunal side, but it also assists the uh, claimant because you know if all these steps are taken, then there is lesser reason for the respondent to be complaining at the end of the day and the court is not going to have any sympathy for the respondent if he had not participated for any legitimate or valid reason. Sure. So yeah. thanks, Sarjit, for that uh, detail. And uh, we'll continue this topic a little bit more because this is the crux of the issue that now we have a non-responsive responsive participant or, or rather non-responsive respondent and uh, how, how to deal with it. What would be the role of the tribunal and the claimant's counsel? So uh, may I also invite uh, Gaurav or Nirav if they have anything to add on this uh, and then uh, we'll go to the uh, next topics. Uh, I, uh, I just wanted to make two short points uh, to add to what Sarji just said. Uh, the general trend in of courts in India is to recognize service by email. Of course, there would be no difficulty at all if an email address or, the, or method of service by email is prescribed in the agreement. But uh, there is a recent decision of Delhi High Court in CNC Maritime, where I think um, the key consideration before the before the court was not only the fact that 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 parties had get, exchanged email addresses and had been corresponding on this email these email address through these email addresses, but there was no denial on affidavit that any email address had changed or no denial that that the email was not really received. So the general trend of courts in India now is to recognize service by email unless there are serious and genuine concerns that the service in fact did not take oh. place, and. And going to the other point in the sense that we don't really have, I mean, I couldn't offhand remember or sort of come across a decision of the Indian Supreme Court that, that sort of gives any guidance as to how a tribunal should consider or conduct itself once a, a respondent becomes non-responsive. But there are two recent decisions of the Indian Supreme Court rendered this year uh, regarding uh, in, in the context of opposition to enforcement and central grief, the, the decision of three judges is quite instructive where I, the way I read the judgment, one of the key considerations for the Supreme Court to reject a, a, a very comprehensive uh, objection to enforcement was the fact that the tribunal in fact kept the respondent informed at every possible stage of the proceeding. Not only that, as a matter of fact, even if um, the smallest possible development had taken place, the tribunal had gone out of the way to keep the respondent informed and yet the respondent was non-responsive. And as a matter of fact, towards the end of the proceedings, the respondent only chose to file a written submission and the tribunal dealt with that also in great detail. So I, I think it, would, it always helps if the tribunal is proactive in ensuring that it's not only a question of service, but throughout the process, the respondent is given an opportunity to mend its ways and come and participate. Uh, Nira, any any additional point that you have, or we move on? One or two minutes. I'll just two short points. I entirely agree with what Sajith and Gaurav uh, said, and even I typically advise clients and the, I make sufficient signal that in the event the is not participating, 
every stage we must keep communicating with him and keeping him abreast as to what is transpiring in the arbitration so he is at all points of time aware that what is happening and what are the consequences of his non participation and as far as domestic arbitration is concerned section 25 of the arbitration act itself contain guidelines of what the tribunal should do in the event the the, the respondent is is non responsive having said that uh, i would like to add one more point to what sarjit said a point that sarjit made from the rules laid down by the chartered institute of arbitrators is that even if the even if there is no respondent i think it should be it should be uh, prudent for the arbitrator to call upon the claimant to still prove up prove his claim still lead evidence and prove all his documents So, in short, that the claimant doesn't get a walk over. I think I would ensure sure. that the claimant does that. Yeah, you are absolutely right, Nira. When that uh, possibly slides into my next question, and I want to bring Prakash on this, uh, is uh, assuming with all the opportunities given to the respondent, they are still not uh, coming forward and appearing before the tribunal. How, how does that change the role of the tribunal vis-a-vis the claimant? I have two or three questions, and maybe I will put it together so that you can then respond. One, uh, does it mean that the proceedings then become adversarial in sense it could be tribunal versus the claimant, as uh, Nira was not saying in that form, but at least claimant has to be, uh, or rather, the tribunal has to be a little more inquisitive. in terms of the case rather than agreeing to what uh, claimants are saying on the face of it uh, two uh, matters may require a lot of technical or expert knowledge if both the parties are there then there is always a uh, possibility of experts evidence and taking assistance uh, even for the tribunal uh, how would that situation be dealt with and then uh, as you said uh the third question i have is sometimes respondents do have uh, a bare defense they don't participate fully but they do have a bare defense on jurisdiction or otherwise uh then how how does that work uh, can payment uh, simply go on that defense and say uh you know uh, dismiss those uh because claim uh, because respondent is not coming forward any further so there are two or three different scenarios but uh, the basic point is how would tribunal react to those situations vis-a-vis claimant uh, in 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 uh, you know situations like those and which may always vary based on facts of each case uh, thank you uh, yeah but uh, there's you know quite a lot in there in those uh, questions uh in fact you could have an entire webinar or perhaps just one of those questions but uh, i'll do my best to sort of break it down uh, and as I'm simply as i can i'm just trying to i'm just trying to <laughs> little bit hasten the process <laughs> considering uh, we have uh, maybe one hour and then a little bit time for the question answers yeah sure no problem at all okay let, let me sort of break this down i mean firstly uh if you know if the if the respondent doesn't turn up then the tribunal and the claimant you know is there any extra that they, they need to there to do are there additional obligations and so on well i mean the starting point and this is a very important starting point i think and there's there's no rule you know within any institutional uh, set of rules that you've got to do anything special the starting point is that if you don't have an argue your case so be it you know it, there's nothing there that compels me the tribunal or the respond on the claim to do anything that is special or different uh, there's no legal obligation for me to sort of bend over backwards to make things easy for you just because you did turn up um it, it, you know if you choose not to turn up it's your choice uh, and you have to live by your own choice so i think that's an important starting point but having said that you know um arbitration is a different species of dispute resolution uh, from the say court litigation Uh, in the sense that it's a consensual process, and with that consensual process, issues of consent and whether I've given my consent for that comes up. There's also issues of natural justice and, and procedural issues of presenting my case that comes up. That makes any process of arbitration makes any award somewhat vulnerable. 
in court, if the guy doesn't turn up, you have plenty of easy things to do, default judgment against you. You can, you know, a judgment and default of filing a defense. Oh, those simple things, you choose not to come, I just enter a judgment. But arbitration is different that way. You know, you can't do that. So what, does, what it means is that the non-responsive respondent who fails to turn up for a hearing or take part in things must make everybody else, you know, uh, careful to ensure that the award that comes up at the end, uh, you know, is not going to be jeopardized by some sort of tripping over of a procedural point. So from a tribunal point of view, what, what is it that you need to do? You need to show that you're independent. You need to show you're neutral. You need to still ensure that the claimant makes out its case. So that's an important point, And that may involve some element of inquiry, some element of you know, being in a hearing, participate a little bit more, bearing in mind there's no counsel presenting a respondent's case. But that doesn't mean that you've got to go overboard and become an, ad and become an advocate for uh, the respondent. Uh, in my time, I had a situation, but this was very, very long ago in the days when uh, you know, international arbitration was, uh, I would say, more than an art than a science than it is today. Uh, we had a tribunal where the respondent essentially walked out, didn't take part in the, in the hearing. And it, what the tribunal, you know, who was under some pressure from the respondent because they were still writing to the ICC to complain about the tribunal, but they were not participating in the hearing. What the, uh, what, the tri what the tribunal did was to take over and you know, go into a sort of investigative inquiry style arbitration, you know, and take, and what they did was to take the full three weeks allocated for that arbitration, for that process. In modern times, none of that would be, uh, would be uh, uh, done anymore because tribunals are one much more confident in themselves. And secondly, that is not the right thing to do. You know, because if you start doing that, you create your own set of problems that possibly, you know, you descended into the arena or you, you know, you took up uh, points that somehow damaged the respondent's case in the end, making, uh, making your award target practice for the respondent uh, when it comes to setting aside or enforcement. So tribunals should not do that. They should just maintain their cool, go through it professionally, ensure that the respondent you know, uh, proves, uh, the claimant proves its case and make your, you know, question appropriately and just leave it at that. From the point of view of the claimant, you can assist the tribunal in doing that. You can, you know, we were talking about notices and so on. That's one of the things that you can ensure happens all the time. That, you know, that the respondent always has notice of everything. You can assist the tribunal in doing that. You can present all your, the facts of the case, your arguments very fairly, very clearly. You're very upfront in, in, your, in, in, in disclosure. You treat it as an ex parte where disclosure requirements can be, you know, a little bit, the bar can be a little bit higher in that sort of scenario. And you can work within that, all in order for you to sort of ensure that you're not tripped up later on. And it's not, uh, you know, uh, the, the award is, it, it doesn't become unenforceable because of any procedural issues. In terms of experts, that's a, that's a very uh, sort of interesting area because, you know, you have, if a respondent doesn't turn up, there's no respondent's expert. So you have a claimant's expert that is opining on an area which requires that sort of expertise, which can be fairly, you know, uh, non-technical, like legal experts, or it can be extremely technical, like, you know, engineering or electronics experts, you know. Things like that. Now, what do you do with that? Uh, a tribunal, I mean, the, again, you don't have to fight the respondent's case. He chose not to come. So you can accept, I mean, you have to do your inquiry. The, the claimant educates you as to what the, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the expert is trying to say. You ask your questions, you know, the, uh, pose your questions to the expert. He can be hot tubbed by himself. It, you know, and it, it would be uh, 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 less than ideal, but it's, it's what you've got to work with, and you can work quite well within that. But you also have the extra option, if it's very technical and you still don't understand it, you can, you know, there are rules like the SIC, the tribunal can appoint its own experts, but then who pays that cost? It'll, it'll end up one way or the other being the claimant paying it. So is it fair on the claimant and, you know, is that overcompensation in favor of the respondent? That, those interests have to be balanced. 
so at the end of the day, you use that a little bit sparingly, uh, and you normally go with, you know, if I understand it and it's clear, properly presented, there's no reason why I can't uh, adopt or not to the extent that I, I feel just what the expert is saying. And finally, your know, issue of, uh, of uh, uh, dismissal. Dismissal. Now, that's, a, that's the, of all the topics here, that's the, the most interesting. If, let's put it this way. You know, if the SIC rules was a pack of cards, uh, the early dismissal under Rule 29 would be the joker in the pack. It, it is, and I mean that in a very good way, you know, because what, a joker can be a very powerful card. What it has for it is flexibility. What it has for it is, you know, because it involves a lot of tribunal discretion, it has the, the advantage of... Um, unpredictability, and I say, you know, I say that again in a good way, because it leads to creative solutions that can work, if you work with certain parameters, can make for a good outcome that saves time and cost. So you start off by applying high thresholds. Uh, rule 29, you know, you, you can't dismiss a claim or a defense unless, of course, the claim or defense is manifestly without legal merit, or it's manifestly outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Now, the, the SIC rules goes further than the exit rules that allows dismissal of claims. SIC rules very interestingly allows dismissals of defenses. And this is in the context of uh, arbitration, which means it doesn't go for hearing. Before that, it gets knocked out, like similar like what you see in court. So you have issues of natural justice, but the SIC decided to put that joker in the pack to allow you within certain parameters for that to happen. Now, one good example of that, uh, and I'll take the example of manifestly without uh, legal merit. You know, I'll, if a claim starts at arbitration, the respondent raises the issue of limitation as its only defense. And it says that the claimant is out of time, bare defense. No particulars, doesn't exhibit documents. You know, uh, the claimant's position is the limitation runs from the date of knowledge. And as documents to prove that in view of the claim from a certain date, it, the thing goes on, a defense file along those lines, discovery, claimant does, respondent doesn't do, witness statements possibly, you know, uh, come into play, where, you know, the knowledge from that point is very clearly established on the documents. Now, you don't have a, 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 a respondent there. Can you use Article 29? Arguably, yes. You, ha you have nothing but a limitation defense. It's a bare defense. Manifestly on the documents, whatever happens is likely to be knocked out, you know, very high threshold, but it's still, it's within the parameters where you can make that sort of argument, you know? So it is in a certain set of facts, a certain situation, a certain very clearly defined uh, box. Can you use early dismissal to knock out a defense, a bare defense uh, 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 filed by a, a, a respondent who subsequently doesn't respond any longer? So it's a very, very, I think, cunning little tool uh, that you could use to your advantage. Sure. No, you were, uh, uh, Prakash, you were right. This, some of these topics are obviously very interesting and can throw upon debates which can go much longer. But uh, considering the time here, may I invite Gaurav on the last point at least on the early dismissal? Because while Singapore may have thrown this joker in the pack, uh, from an Indian context, uh, do you think uh, you would recommend someone to use it or uh, play the game a little more conservative? Yeah. What's your uh, uh, Indian view on that? If the by, by you have while you have seen Singapore and London closely, but uh, I think uh, if you can give an Indian point on that. If, if I was to, if, if my client was uh, intending to enforce the award in India, then I would steer away from early dismissal. I think, um, why, I think this overwhelming ju judicial precedent that we have seen in the last few years towards upholding international awards, international arbitration awards, is in the context of courts being satisfied that more than an adequate opportunity to participate uh, was provided. Um, having sort of, at least from a domestic arbitration perspective, I can say that I generally find courts quite averse to early dismissals, summary dismissals, where even, so the threshold is likely to be very high. 
So, um, but having said that, there would be cases, I mean, I haven't really come across any so far, but there would be cases where really the defense is hopeless. And even if the, if the arbitral tribunal was to extend the proceeding, would end up saying whatever it would have said at that stage. Um, but to the extent that, that early dismissal, uh, the, the, the case for early dismissal is, is um, meets the very high threshold, I could perhaps have no, no, no choice but to go ahead with it. If it's a 50-50 case or, or uh, the threshold is merely touch and go, then I would always be the cautious, very cautious approach. Um, yeah, that's broadly what I would sure. I wanted a lot. one. I wanted to just yeah. add one more point about experts. <laughs> Please. From an Indian arbitration arbitration law perspective, I think that if the matter was very, very technical, even in an ex parte proceeding, I think uh, an Indian tribunal, depending on need, would be very proactive in seeking an independent expert appointed by, by the tribunal. Uh, as a matter of fact, I general trend even today, and I think Vyapar can meet up might even confirm that, is that even when parties, both parties in a contested matter, lead expert evidence of their own, I think there is a reasonable percentage of cases where tribunals trust their own experts rather than party-nominated experts. So I think that sure. that might still still be possible before tribunal. Got it. So uh, we we have quite a few uh, very interesting questions from the participants, and I would definitely want to touch upon that. But before that, maybe I can take uh, one more topic very quickly, uh, and that is. Uh, in fact, very important topic, which is the costs and the deposits. Because uh, now we have payment who is running the arbitration, respondent is not coming forward, institution is asking for money uh, or the arbitral tribunal in an ad hoc situation. And ultimately, claimants have to pay and bear the cost uh, of respondent as well, including for experts as uh, Prakash or Gaurav was uh, referring. So all of that is, uh, you know, coming on to uh, the payment uh, as a burden at the start with. They can, they can recover it later if they win in the award, but uh, they are already out of pocket. So let me bring Sarjit here first if he's fine. And uh, his perspective, will the claimant have to pay the full cost uh, upfront? Uh, is there a way to ask for an interim award on costs or uh, under the CEC rules. What is your thought as to how would claimant deal with this situation uh, to at least, uh, you know, recover some damage uh, during the process rather than wait for a final award to get implemented? Uh, you, are, you are on mute, Sergeant. Sorry. Uh, the yeah. important thing to bear in mind is that, you know, um, both the claimant and the respondent are jointly and severally liable uh, to pay the costs of the arbitration. So uh, for, uh, from the start, uh, SIC will usually say 50% to be borne by claimant and 50% to be borne by the respondent. But if the respondent is non-responsive, then uh, usually the claimant would have to pay 100% of the cost and uh, that will be taken care of at the end of the day uh, when the award is made. If the claimant succeeds in his claim, uh, then uh, the respondent may be made to pay 100% of the cost of the arbitration that has been incurred uh, by the claimant for himself plus the respondent as well. So that has been my experience. Sure. Uh, any very quick comments from Gaurav or Prakash on this? Uh, very quick, one minute each. I think the situation would be pretty much similar in India. I think there was a, um, I think there was a, until a few years ago, in before arbitral tribunals seated in India, particularly if they were former judges, Indian arbitrators, we faced a little bit of a, 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 a psychological barrier in getting full costs because that is not the way it was done in courts. But I think that has changed. It has changed. Um, uh, and, and I think it, the scheme would be pretty much the same. If, if, if the respondent is non-responsive, then the claimant pays, and that's made a subject matter of the, the award and costs eventually. Sure. Um, yeah, very quickly, um, th there is this facility for getting an interim award of costs under Rule 27G of the SIC rules. The SIC is an example of that. I mean, the Stockholm rules is the one which is also pretty well developed when it comes to these things. 
uh, one can see that uh, you know you don't pay your deposits. You can avail your the, risk, the claimant can avail itself of that, get a partial award or interim award for costs against a responsive respondent. You can see it's clear value, you know, because it, what it does then is the tribunal that's ordering it, and, and if you don't comply, I mean, you can see this is going down a slippery slope uh, as you head uh, towards the main hearing. Uh, that you've defied an award from, uh, from the tribunal that's hearing the claim. But for a non-responsive, what's the value? Uh, what I can think of is that you get that quickly done. So you get an, an interim award for a large amount of cost. Uh, a respondent who's sitting pretty trying to avoid things suddenly is faced with enforcement procedures in his jurisdiction, way ahead of you know, a, a timeline that he was probably contemplating, uh, post-hearing and so on. So you save yourself a few months and you unsettle the respondent. So, and you may even get a collection if you're lucky. So that's the advantage I see. So, so uh, we have a couple of more questions uh, as planned, but I think let's first take a couple of questions from the participants. There are uh, quite a few uh, interesting ones. So may I first invite uh, Nirav to, uh, if he's okay. There are two questions. One is specifically Nirav for you, and one is little generic, but. Uh, I think you may be able to answer. So first question is what, uh, I, I think it is from Keshav and the second one is from Mr. Shanmugam, uh, is what impact does non-participation in arbitration have on enforcement proceedings? Uh, Nero, if you can yeah, answer yeah, that can. a little bit. And yeah. the second one is uh, specific for you, which is how do you deal with clients who invoke an arbitration and then prolong proceedings deliberately? Uh, uh, for reasons, one of them can be wait till the commercial contract expire. So, uh, if you want to take yeah, uh, so I'll, both I'll, or either of them, yeah, I'll take both actually. So, as far as the first question is concerned, the jurisprudence on setting aside of an arbitral award, whether it be domestic or foreign, is fairly settled in India, as nicely enunciated by Gaurav a short while ago. Uh, when it comes to enforcement of a foreign award in India, the scope for courts interference is very limited. If the party who is trying to enforce the award can demonstrate that the respondent or the party against whom the award is to be enforced was adequately served, he had notice of the arbitration and despite notice he did not participate and post that the arbitrator has gone ahead and decided the arbitration on merits. In that situation, I really do not see any chance of such an, enforce of, of, of such an enforcement of award being interfered by the court in India. So I, I personally don't see this as too much of an issue, but like Gaurav said, there could be some issue with respect to the, the backlog of cases in India, but on merits, I really don't see such an award being interfered by courts in India. And uh, the, the law also is fairly settled on this. Um, oh. As far as the second, second question, when, when somebody prolongs on its own, like a payment. Right. right. So, I mean, once an arbitration is initiated and the claimant himself prolongs the arbitration, doesn't help his cause versus the contract, whether he allows the contract or not or not. Because the cause of action to initiate the arbitration may think the respondent has already arisen. And if a delay occurs, then consequences for that delay will naturally follow. So to my sure. mind, prolonging the arbitration with an in ulterior intent to expand or run out the contract may not really help any of the parties. So I think tribunal can take care of the situation, I guess. Yes. And uh, from Mr. Shanmugam, I think there is one more question for Sarjit. And this is in reference to the guidelines, Sarjit, you referred of Chartered yes. Institute of Arbitrators. Yes. Uh, as to uh, are these guidelines uh, to be followed as the guidelines in dealing with non-responsive respondents or can arbitrators also rely on other guidelines, maybe by IBA or any other body? Um, these are just guidelines. I, I, I refer to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators guidelines. There are other guidelines issued by the IBA or any other bodies. Uh, I mean, they will go along the same lines. So uh, there is no compulsion, but this is good practice. So uh, uh, um, the tribunals would be allowed to the fact that you know this is good practice and they will try to abide by all these guidelines that are out there. Sure. There's one more interesting question and I can throw it on to uh, each one of you, whoever wants to pick it up. 
it's a little generic one from Mohit. If the respondent does not file or prosecute in defense, despite being given sufficient opportunities, then why can't the tribunal proceed ex parte? Why is the notice served through email not deemed to be served? Uh, I think we covered this topic. I think Gaurav and Prakash also Nirav did touch upon it, but maybe one of you can quickly respond that absolutely, in my view at least, tribunal is entitled to proceed ex parte with uh, certain uh, precautions of uh, not just accepting the case of claimant as it is, but uh, if you have, if one of you have any other thoughts. No, I agree with you. I think I, I think the tribunal would have jurisdiction to proceed ex parte, except that that it would not it would not treat the claimant's case to have been admitted only because the defense has not been filed. Sure. Um, and service by email would be sufficient as long as as long as the court does not take a view that that that, that there was genuinely no notice of the arbitration. Um, any yeah. anybody who's trying to act clever would I think face difficulty in India. In the context of international arbitration, particularly, I, I, I wanted to, because uh, for the benefit of the international audience, um, in Vijay Karia's case, the Supreme Court uh, imposed very heavy costs because somebody raised a defense of not having been given a fair opportunity to participate at the state of arbitration at this, during the arbitration. Um, and the Supreme Court came down very heavily, particularly because it was an international arbitral award. And if I remember correctly, it imposed costs to the extent of nearly a hundred thousand Singapore dollars on the party that had pursued brought the matter to the Supreme Court. That's true. That's correct. Uh, there is one more interesting question from Abhinash. Uh, in current situations where the dilatory tactics are being in ongoing proceedings, how can arbitrators proactively act for efficiency, taking into account due process paranoia? I think again, this is the same question. I think Keshav also has the same question, but. Uh, uh, if uh, Prakash or Nirav, you want to uh, come in for maybe 30 second response to this. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right that we've sort of handled that, but more in the context of a, an unresponsive or non responsive respondent. Uh, one that plays games with the tribunal, but he's responsive. I mean, you still have to take, the tribunal has to take some care, you know, because you know that uh, one of the things he might be trying to do is setting you up uh, for failure in terms of you know, setting aside your award. So you've got to strike a balance between accommodating legitimate points and concerns and being you know, uh, uh, quite strict about or professional or you know, sensible about maintaining uh, processes and, and timelines within the arbitration. I think that's quite important. It's that balance and a good tribunal can do that pretty well. It protects itself by giving in when it can without, you know, losing too much. But at the same time, you know, where it, it tends to lose things, like, for instance, it may result in a vacation of hearing dates, it pushes back. And modern tribunals have become pretty skilled in doing so. They're not there, you know, to be messed around with oh. by a delinquent respondent. That's true. I think uh, there is very good comment from uh, one of our friends, Ganesh Chandru, who is is participant uh, here. But he, he also, I think, points out that uh, at least on the issue of prolonging the arbitration, I think Section 29A, at least for a domestic arbitration now in India, requires tribunal to close the matters, you know, within a stipulated time. So I think that can also come to the rescue of any such prolongation. I think uh, that's maybe one additional point to what Nero responded to that question. But... Uh, I mean, uh, continuing the discussion on enforcement and bringing Sarjit uh, maybe as a last point, and then we'll, I'll invite everyone to have their closing remarks. Uh, so on the enforcement, while Nirav did uh, address that now, most of the jurisdictions, uh, including India, Singapore was always uh, proactive, uh, is uh, that there is always the courts uh, are looking for you know uh, reasons not to interfere than reasons for in to interfere and therefore so long as there is a proper service uh, you know enforcement generally should be allowed uh, so long as it is shown that respondent was given an opportunity and it is for the respondent then to deal with it but any 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 thoughts surjit on that uh, what if respondent comes back and shows that he was genuinely not served or there was some confusion uh, there was 
even if it was an opportunity it is not sufficient do you think courts go into those aspects very you know uh, seriously or uh, or so long as there is a prima facie uh, service that is good enough for enforcement I think, action i i think as far as the courts are concerned right if the respondent can show the court that he really didn't have any notice of the arbitration then that's really very very fundamental and uh, i i'm sure the singapore courts even would get involved and set aside the award but if the court that feel that you know uh, actually uh, the respondent was aware uh, whether peripherally or in some shape or form uh, of the arbitration and he actually was non responsive because he was trying to delay the process or you know he was trying to play games with the the process then there will be really very very scant uh, 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 sympathy for that i i don't believe i've come across any uh, serious case where you know uh, the uh, especially recently where the award has been set aside uh because the uh the respondent was not uh, given notice of the uh, uh, did not have proper notice of the arbitration especially recently and with modern communications with emails and the like it's very very difficult uh for uh, commercial organizations especially to go and argue that they did, did not have notice especially if the tribunal is going to keep the respondent informed at every stage of the proceeding somewhere along no. the way uh, it would come to the notice of the res respondent it may be a different situation if it's a individual uh, who has gone missing sure i think there is one uh, another question from parag is the tribunal required to consider the case of respondent which emerges from pre arbitration cor correspondence between the party i think again we dealt with this a little bit i think prakash uh also alluded to it in terms of what is the tribunal's role while tribunal doesn't seat uh and becomes uh, adversarial uh or a, or acts like a respondent's counsel but definitely considers certain documents if they come across uh the proceedings before uh, the tribunal uh as to you know whether claimant's case is uh you know uh, valid uh but nirav any any thoughts or uh, gaurav any thoughts on that i i would look i would i would look at this positively if i am for the claimant i would in fact invite the tribunal to look at the pre arbitration correspondence which will give the tribunal an indication of what the dispute is what the claimant's case is and what the respondent's opposition to that case is in that sense if i have the pre arbitration correspondence where the respondent has in some fashion or the other laid out its case its arguments against the claimant then i can argue with the tribunal that even though the respondent is non responsive or not participating you the tribunal does have uh, something which they can take into account something like an opposition or a response to my claim so in fact i would encourage and invite the tribunal to look at every piece of correspondence exchanged between the parties pre arbitration and it will help me Uh, evolve the arbitration from an ex parte to an adversarial and contested litigation sure so we are coming very close to the close of the session uh, but uh, maybe one last question uh, from amanda and then we'll we'll uh, close with the closing remarks from each one of you and that goes to the issues of deposits i think prakash uh, answered that but if you want to add anything to the question as to how tribunals are ready or amenable to such orders is it common uncommon uh, it is is it easy to get those kind of orders no that's a, i mean that's actually quite a good question it's a it, developing field you know um, i think it is um, most developed in the context of the stockholm chamber of commerce rules because over there there's a lot of literature about what tribunals should and should not do uh typically uh, if and, and it, it's they 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 sort of suggesting that to be best practices for tribunals around the world so it's evolving in my view in that direction which is that you know you would grant them you know unless there's a reason not to do so so you lean towards granting them because you know it's a contractual breach not to sort of honor your obligation to provide deposits so you start off with that premise so unless the uh, respondent has a good reason 
Good reason being a number. Uh, one of them would be jurisdictional objection, again, maybe impecuniosity, another, you know. Thirdly, possibly, uh, it's late in the day. The request for interim, uh, for, for deposits or, or the application for, for an interim award comes very, very close to the, you know, the time of the hearing, possibly. Then it's easy for the tribunal to say, look, you know, we've come more, for 80% of the way. Let's just finish this off and, you know, I'll make my cost award at the end. At the end. So I think, you know, normally, yes, unless there's a reason not to. And these are the three main reasons. Sure. Excellent. So uh, let me then invite for your closing comments. Uh, and then maybe we, we end the webinar on time so that, you know, uh, we respect all the participants here joining with us. And thank you for that. Uh, whoever wants to start with Gaurav, Sarjit. Any so parting I, I comments think, on this? I, I think if I, may, if I may just make one short point to conclude, and this is the advice that comes out of my mouth whenever an Indian client now discusses delay or non-participation in, in an international arbitration, or for that matter, even a domestic arbitration with me. The, the, the first answer is uh, don't do it unless you have genuine reasons because of which you can't participate. And I think, so that's point number one. That is the advice lawyers gave. Point number two, courts don't take delinquent non-participant, not non-participating respondents uh, lightly anymore. You, you see an, the opposite trend and you see a very sort of strong censure. Therefore, you don't want to be in that position in any event. Um, and the third is that if you, if you represent the claimant in, in a proceeding of that kind where the respondent is not, not participating, then to the extent possible, assist the tribunal to engage with whatever materials have been brought before the tribunal on behalf of the respondent. So that, so that to the extent possible, the respondent's case has been dealt with in the order. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, if, yes, if I may, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, as far as smaller organizations are concerned, right, they are uh, uh, slowly getting uh, more educated as far as uh, arbitrations are concerned. Uh, these uh, organizations used to view arbitrations as private affairs without much consequence if they don't participate. I think uh, these days as lawyers, uh, we uh, have to educate uh, these uh, smaller organizations that look, these are serious affairs and uh, uh, awards can be made even if you don't turn up uh, for the arbitration. Uh, I, I think that's uh, um, uh, really uh, sinking in now. So people are definitely taking arbitrations more seriously than they used to in the past. But having said that, I think tribunals are also very, very careful uh, when they proceed, uh, when the, uh, uh, where, where the respondent is not responsive, uh, they do uh, insist on, you know, uh, keeping the, uh, the respondent uh, apprised of the, uh, the proceedings at every stage and including just before uh, coming up with their award. And they are also very careful to recite in their award every stage where they have kept the respondent in, uh, informed. Uh, Nidav, any yeah. last comment? There's also think, one question uh, which is very generic uh, by Amir. A strange situation involving an LCIE arbitration where arbitrator is non-responsive. Can you give an <laughs> idea of what should be done in such a case? I guess you need to contact uh, good lawyers like Nidav or Prakash or Gaurav or Sanjit. And also maybe revisit the whole webinar. But uh, <laughs> any any other free advice, uh, Nirav, you may want to uh, give to Amir. Yeah, I, I I think pretty much Gaurav and Sarjit and Prakash have pretty much summed up all the issues that, that have been involved. But I, I mean, I just want one one last comment to make is is people generally tend to view that if uh, to, to view an award which has been passed without the presence of a respondent as an ex parte award, and people tend to view it very suspiciously. I think I think we should we should you know allay those fears because as long as the tribunal and the claimant can demonstrate that the respondent was given adequate notice, he had, he was at all points of time made aware of what developments are happening in the arbitration. And if despite that, if a respondent doesn't appear and the tribunal passes an award, I think for all practical purposes we can we can safely advise the clients that I don't see that to be an issue. The courts will be very reluctant to interfere with such an award unless there is some serious informity, like 
lack of arbitration agreement or the dispute is beyond the scope of reference kind sure. of a scenario otherwise sure. i i think we should stop looking at an ex parte award suspiciously yeah i think there is a difference between ex parte award and a default award i think so long as it is on merits yes. uh, whether two parties appear or one party appear i think so long as tribunal has given uh, you know award on merits and ensure that respondent is given an opportunity i think that should be good enough but any final one sentence <laughs> uh from prakash and we'll close uh, on time yes my my one sentence is just a word of caution uh don't and still in the same sentence with a colon no do not under under as do not uh, overestimate your chances just because a response uh, responded doesn't show up there may be legitimate reasons the jurisdictional objection is a big big painful sting in the tail of the scorpion and you know and even if you do proceed uh, with the arbitration there are all kinds of traps in the process that you've got to sort of navigate working with the tribunal to ensure that your award is enforceable so do not overestimate your chances word of caution so sure. thank you thanks a lot thanks a lot to each one of you because i think uh, we we had a very very lively uh, you know panel uh, with all the practical experiences put together i think it may be more than 100 years of experience uh, here <laughs> which the participants got uh, the advantage of so thanks a lot if all the participants I think we're to join on a saturday <laughs> i know <laughs> I, i just guess it is at least more than 100 years i don't want to uh, you know overreach anybody's age but <laughs> uh, but thanks a lot all the participants to join on a saturday and uh, you know uh, staying through uh, and asking so many questions which i hope we could answer it uh, on the go so thanks a lot everyone thanks ciac for having us on this panel and looking forward to more discussions uh and more webinars as uh, scac has already you know listed on their website so uh see you all soon thank you thank you thank you very much thank you vyapak